It's been 22 years since Tactics Ogre, The Night of Lotus, was released in North America. Not counting remakes, it is the last entry to be released in the Ogre Battle series, while simultaneously being first chronologically. This prequel is a self-admitted side story, being titled Tactics Ogre Gaiden, The Night of Lotus, in Japan. Development History Released in Japan on June 21, 2001, before being localized and released on May 2, 2002 in North America, Tactics Ogre The Night of Lotus would be Quest's last game before being assimilated into Square, right before Square merged with Enix. If you've been following this series for the last few Ogre Battle games, then you know that the developer of this game, Quest, has been Matsuno-less since his departure after Tactics Ogre on the Super Nintendo. Yasumi Matsuno, the brain father of the Ogre Battle series, whether poached or of his own accord, left Quest to work at Squaresoft and created his most well-known work, Final Fantasy Tactics, while Quest kept developing Ogre Battle games. We covered Ogre Battle 64, Person of Lordly Caliber, almost two years ago, and determined that Quest, even without its previous captain at its helm, was able to create a faithful progression of the original Ogre Battle formula. Were they able to do the same with the Tactics Ogre blueprint? Keep watching to find out. In an interview from 2001 on the Nintendo of Japan website, Quest CEO Makato Takugawa, the Knight of Lotus director Yuichi Murazawa, and Takuji Hara of Nintendo's business department, Technology Division, sat down to talk about the game and the design choices made to tailor the experience to a handheld. Which leads us into gameplay. The Night of Lotus being in the same Tactics Ogre series might have you believe that it plays just like the OG Tactics Ogre. This is half true. It retains many of the core systems like the isometric grid-based display, job system, and an emphasis on unit facing and counterattacks. But they discuss in the interview the decision to do away with the NATS, the non-alternative turn system. So instead of your units each having their own place in the turn order queue based on their armor, speed, and action taken, in the Knight of Lotus you have more traditional phases where all of your units move and perform their actions, and then all of the enemies have their go. This change along with the design choice not to let your units move after performing their one action per turn changes the flow and the strategy dramatically from its predecessor. Director Murazawa says that the change from the Nats was made to simplify the experience and make it easier to quit mid-battle, and this makes sense. Trying to keep track of the turn order of sometimes over 12 units while picking up and putting down the game could be unwieldy. At any time except quest mode and during the opponent's turn, you can utilize the Suspense. feature. This saves exactly where you are in battle, so you can resume on your next subway ride, presumably. This presents an opportunity for save scumming that would be further developed into the Chariot system in future Tactics Ogre remakes, but for my first playthrough, I didn't use the suspend feature for fear that it worked like the temporary saves of Majora's Mask that lost me countless hours. Okay, maybe three hours at most. I would advise players use the suspend feature during some of the game's rare castle siege sections where you are unable to use traditional saves between battles, especially during the grueling final stretch. The best and singularly Knight of Lotus edition is the emblem system. When asked about the inspiration behind the emblems, Murazawa said, at first, we were just talking over drinks, but we started talking about how sometimes, when playing Tactics Ogre, there are people who do incredible things. We were talking about how it's nice to see things like that. And it occurred to me that it would be interesting to pick out situations like that and evaluate them in the form of medals. It was just a random idea at first, but when I tried it, it turned out to be surprisingly interesting. I actually wanted to set up around 100 medals, but this time the limit was 32. There are 35 medals in total, and the limit for one person is 32. There are medals for men only, women only, and also medals for different races. 
The emblems are my favorite gameplay addition to this entry for multiple reasons. You start out with at most maybe one emblem, depending on how you answered your tarot questions, and staring at that screen and seeing all the empty squares created, in me at least, a need to fill them. During battles, you're able to peek at enemies' emblems as well, and pressing the select button gives you the lowdown and possible clues on how to unlock them for yourself. For instance, the Knight Certificate Medal is awarded to those who attack head-on. Head-on. Apply directly to the forehead. Head-on. Apply directly to the forehead. Head-on. Apply directly to the forehead. Head-on. Available at Walgreens. Unless you read the manual and had already figured it out, the emblem does the job of communicating to the player that if you want your units to change to the Knight class, then you better start attacking head-on. This is the first step in letting the player know that most jobs will have an emblem component which creates a great incentive to experiment during gameplay on the off chance you might unlock a new emblem, and therefore, potentially, a whole new class. Aside from job prerequisites, emblems can also boost your stats. The sniper emblem rewards the unit with increased agility after successfully performing five ranged attacks in a row. Some emblems can even be negative. I recruited a fairy early on in my first playthrough, and decided to throw her straight into the enemy on the first turn with a dinky sword and no armor. The fairy's excellent movement speed meant that they could attack the opponent on the very first turn, but the counterattack almost one-shotted my poor little Tinkerbell. This awarded my unit the Don Quixote emblem for taking a counterattack that took two-thirds of their life total and decreases their intelligence by ten. A lesson, not to rush in, but in my defense, I thought they were windmills. The excitement of finding a new emblem on an enemy and figuring out what you need to do to unlock it creates a fun scavenger hunt mentality, and I would love to see it in other tactical RPGs. A stranger addition that I didn't pick up on until my Route B playthrough is Biorhythm. Murazawa likens Biorhythm to a luck stat. Certain units like demons and goats can lower your unit's biorhythm, and also sending a unit in solo can have the same negative effect. A lower biorhythm results in wimpier attacks and lower defenses, so in this way, the game discourages rushing in at the leader and rewards methodical play. There are two other interesting additions to the gameplay in Knight of Lotus. Only one which I can speak of. Quest mode and battle mode. Even back when I had friends, With Game Boy Advances, none of them had the impeccable taste in games that I did, so battle mode has only ever been an interesting potential for me. Quest mode, however, fucking rules. As you progress through the campaign, you will unlock maps for quest mode. From the main menu, you can access this mode and play one-off repeatable battles for great items, new maps, and special abilities. They're not so much quests like you may expect, but they give the player an opportunity to challenge themselves with rewards not found in the main game. You can't gain levels or suspend during these matches, but you can set the difficulty to a degree by selecting the amount of turns and whether or not the objective is to murder the leader or the whole opposing side. The level of your rewards are determined by the level of difficulty you impose on yourself. I remember spending hours grinding for glass pumpkins back in the day, but we'll talk more about that in the secrets section. Story.
Unlike my other videos where I give the initial hook of the story, I will go over the entire saga of The Night of Lotus because it's not that long. So consider this your spoiler warning on the main plot. There will be a further spoiler warning as we get into the game's connection with the overall ogre battle plot. The main character, insert your name here, the manual gives the name, Alphonse, is on a mission with his friend Richter. I'm not sure you realize what we're getting ourselves into. Might be the game's best bit of foreshadowing, followed up with Alphonse's fortune being told before heading to sea. The Ogre Battle series sure loves its tarot readings. I've always liked these openings because they make me feel like my playthrough could be wildly different depending on the answers I give. I know now that this is used more to determine the main character's stats, but as a child playing this game's story seemed limitless. I never had the manual for this game growing up having purchased a loose cart from my local Rhino Games, so it is only recently I read this background information. The island of Ovis, located to the west of the continent of Galicia, has been under the rule of the Holy Lotus Empire for the last 15 years, and its inhabitants have been forced to convert to Lotusism. Although the southern region, Anser, initially resisted subjugation, today it flourishes because of trade with the mainland, and the lives of its people have been enriched. Renanculus, the northern region of Ovis, which is surrounded by mountains and forests, accepted the conversion without putting up a fight. At present, inhabitable land is scarce, and now only a few aristocrats and civilians live there. Alphonse, the main character of the story, and a member of the Order of the Sacred Flame of Felis, visits this region to investigate an unusual occurrence. His life will forever be changed from his encounters with the people there. Anyways, you set off on your journey, and seconds after disembarking, you're attacked by bandits. After defeating what seems like all of them, a straggler attempts to murder your friend Richter, which is averted by your quick reflexes. Richter is saved, but you are now adrift in the ocean. You wake up to Eleanor. She found you like Link on the shore. Next comes Ivana, a knight clad in red armor. She has an idea where your group might be based on rumors circulating. As the story progresses, Ivana reveals that she is the daughter of the previous Lord of Renanculus and niece to the current ruler, Nerys, who comes into play later. The story, in tactics over fashion, reveals that everyone has ulterior motives and the truth is as slippery as a mermaid's fluke. At first it seems you're following Richter as a member of the Sacred Flame to answer a call to arms from a colony under the Boot of Lotus, Lotus having violently conquered those who did not peacefully surrender to their religious reformation campaign known as Lotusism. As Alphonse tries to reunite with his compatriot Richter, he's made fun of by his enemies for his naivety in believing that his Order of the Sacred Flame is here on a simple peacekeeping mission. Turns out Richter is after a powerful magical weapon said to have been a deciding factor in a war between humans and mermaids hundreds of years ago on this island. Just because this game is on the Game Boy Advance, don't let it fool you into thinking this is a dumbed down game for kids. Its scope and replayability might pale in comparison to the original Tactics Ogre, but stack this up against almost anything else, especially on a handheld, and the Knight of Lotus will impress with its multiple paths and well-realized world. Up until its conclusion, the story keeps throwing revelations at the player that has them question what this quest is really about. Thankfully, I had completely forgotten the main plot, except for it having something to do with mermaids, so I was able to relive this experience in all of its twists and complexity. The story delves into the theme of identity. Alphonse has been the protege of Richter, but when events physically separate them, he realizes that he has to follow his own path. He is saved and bound by oath to a woman named Sybil, who works for the Church of Lotus for a time, but even after he fulfills his promise and gains his freedom back, he no longer wants to go back home to his old life. The plot has two main paths that we'll call Route A and Route B because of their associated endings. Route A is achieved in part by deciding to trust Sybil, and Route B results from going your own way when Sybil presents her plan. Either way, he finds information from the main group of mermaids leader, Chloeri, that the lance was stolen by a golden-scaled mermaid named Berivra. Fucking Christ, these names. Because she fell in love with a human and wanted the war between humans and the mermaids to stop to prevent harm to her lover. These events took place around 400 years ago. Mermaids live much longer than humans. 
This golden mermaid is still alive, but has never made contact back with the main group. They are no longer angry at her betrayal, and tell our main character to beckon her back to the fold if they come across her. Alphonse remembers, after meeting with the Church of Lotus's agent, Sybil, that Eleanor, at the very beginning of the game, told him she had once seen a mermaid with brilliant golden scales. We make our way back to the church on the shore that we washed up on, and question Eleanor about what she had mentioned. There's an implication that the father, her adoptive father, and also a priest, has abused her because we find her with blood on her face. She is angry at us too for questioning her about the mermaid and not coming back to her for any other romantic reasons. This is where the love plot of the game comes in. I don't know if there was a better way to implement it in a GBA game, but I like it well enough. It feels like it comes out of nowhere. But our main character is 15, and I'm guessing Eleanor is too, so these feelings might be the intense longings associated with that age. Eleanor and us are pursued from the church because Richter and maybe other groups are searching after the lance and anyone who has information on its whereabouts. Once Richter catches up to us, we are cornered at a ledge above the sea. He says that Eleanor is actually the daughter of the mermaid and the human. Before this information can be processed, Richter's men come at us. We're about to fall when Eleanor's coral pendant shines a brilliant light that paralyzes everyone but the main character. It even seems to paralyze Eleanor, but it's not super clear from the sprite work. Eleanor and Lands decide to jump even after Eleanor asks if he can swim and he says, I'm not a good swimmer. They find the cove where the lost gold mermaid Berivra makes her home. She recognizes Eleanor as the adoptive daughter, not biological, and tells Eleanor as much. Then she gives them the location of the spear. The location no longer houses the spear, but Alphonse hatches a plan. He discovers an object associated with Richter's family at the location and has a hunch that Richter must have more information related to the spear. So Alphonse asks Sybil to leak some rumors that they found the spear and makes his way to Richter to find out what he knows. Meanwhile, Richter is up north playing Neris Patrol, Ivana's uncle, and who is rumored to have killed the previous lord and father of Ivana. Neris has his own intentions for the lance, the name of which is now given as Longiculness, aka Longhorn. Depending on what route you're on at this point, you either kill or recruit Richter. And let me just pause to applaud this game. For going above and beyond in the story department. It would have been simple to have Richter be a pawn of his father, but instead the game goes out of its way to make sure Alphonse thinks aloud that Richter has his own motivations for the spear. There are multiple candidates at any given time for the main antagonist in this story, and none of them are black and white, even Shahar, who comes out near the end of the story. So as the story lays all of its pieces out for the upcoming finale, we have Richter, your previous commander slash childhood friend deceiving his father and the current Lord of Renanculus in a Delita level play to hold the power of the Longicalness and form his own country based on his conception of order, then Neris, who so far has been portrayed as a fratricidal regent with little ambiguity, goes into his fairly logical motivations for why he wants the power of the pointy horn. He watched his country burn and surrendered by his weak and ill of health brother while he was powerless to being born the younger brother with no claim to the throne. Unwilling to watch Lotus take over his homeland, he poisons his brother and with the power of Longicolness, vows to bring victory and pride back to his country. No one is pure and no one is all wrong in Tactics Ogre. After defeating Richter, there's a battle in the dungeons of the Renanculus castle. A piece of the spear had been found by Richter as a young boy on the beach. He had dropped it in the spooky crypt below the castle and forgotten about it until now. This piece is possessed by the fallen angel Shear, who takes control of the power-hungry Neris's mind. Neris has been assisted by two strange magicians who turned out now to be double agent angels of Shear. You battle Neris, killing him, and release the spirit of Shear, who bids you to find him at the angel's headstone for the final battle. Shayer had helped the humans fight by order of God in the previous ogre battle. 
Jealous of how much God cared for humans, Shayer was cast down to an icy purgatory, stuck between heaven and hell on the island of Ovis, which had been said in myth was a prison. As mentioned before, it would have been so easy to have Shayer be a one-sided demon, but instead he's a fallen angel who clearly still wants to be in God's good graces, but cannot overcome his envy and lack of understanding as to why God seems to value these lesser humans over him and his fellow angels. This is of course one of the oldest stories of all time. Old Scratch, Beelzebub, Lucifer, you know, you love him, girl, Satan. This game gives him his own twist and depending on your ending, some redemption, but overall this is the story I was raised on every Sunday. Depending on your choices throughout the story, and who is still alive at the end of the final battle, you can have one of four endings, not counting a game over or the super, super, super secret A plus ending we'll talk about in the spoilers. Ending A. For being the A ending, this one sure is a gut punch. Shayer is about to nuke the party, but if you've kept Eleanor alive and in your party and are on route A, then Eleanor sacrifices herself to save the rest of the party, and her and Shayer enter the afterlife together. Alphonse returns as a new recruit of the Hand of the Pope, the same organization that Sybil belongs to. Ivana rules Renanculus as their new queen. In ending B, also known as the happy ending, same criteria except on route B. Instead of Eleanor, Sybil sacrifices herself. In her last moment, she reveals that she is Eleanor's sister as well. Alphonse and Eleanor leave for greener pastures and are never heard from again. Richter rules Renanculus with Ivana, Hond and Hond. Ending C and D. Ending C is achieved by not including Eleanor in the final battle so that she is waiting outside Angel's headstone, cursing your name for leaving her. Meanwhile, Shayer blows you and your party up in his despair at dying without God's love. Ending D plays out almost exactly the same way, but requires you to have brought Eleanor but have her die or be petrified during the last fight. Shayer blows you up in this scenario as well, but the statue that breaks outside of Angel's headstone with Eleanor in ending C breaks alone. There's also a special game over ending that happens in two variations, either dying normally or forgetting to bring the special spear Longiconus to the battle in the last fight. Shayer's final form cannot be damaged at all unless first pierced by his own long horn, which is of course the spear. Alphonse will lament his stupidity for forgetting the spear after a certain number of turns goes by. Now to find out about the A-plus ending, follow me into the spoiler spoiler section. Spoilers. I had been spoiled on this before replaying the game during research for my other Tactics Ogre videos, so I didn't want to spoil it for anyone else watching this video. I'm pretty sure I, I've already spoiled it in my other Tactics Ogre videos, but almost no one watched those, so fuck y'all anyways. Just kidding, I didn't realize it was a spoiler at the time. I had never gotten the A-plus ending as a kid, and had just assumed when uncovering the connection that I had been a dumb little baby bitch who hadn't put the pieces together. The secret A-plus ending is a bitch to get, and thankfully I just happened to almost get it on my first playthrough this time around. The biggest hurdle is the time limit. You have to beat the game in 25 hours. This isn't actually that difficult, but on your first playthrough, I wouldn't recommend it. It takes a lot of the joy out of the game, and experimenting becomes too costly as a result. I would shoot for this ending on your second playthrough. The other requirements I can attest to are having less than 5 of your units die, and having Alphonse kill 50 units. This is the only requirement that kept me from getting this on my first run. Quest mode does count towards these kills if you want to abuse that. If you do all of those things on the A route and fulfill all the other A ending requirements, you are rewarded with a short after credit scene. that shows that Alphonse is none other than Lancelot Tartaros of Tactics Ogre. Punished Alphonse, if you will. 
since the only recorded version on all of YouTube appears to be a 240 rip stretched into unholy widescreen, I will show it here so you can also bask in its glory without the headache of having to actually achieve it. If y'all want me to make a separate video with all of the endings, I can do that as well, if there is enough demand. Lovely YouTuber slash OgreNut Warren Report has a video outlining all of the endings for this game, but doesn't have the cutscene videos from the game, so there isn't an easy way to watch all of the endings without skimming through random Let's Plays where people are reading out the dialogue aloud. I haven't been able to find any direct interview or acknowledgement from Matsuno on how much he approves of the story and gameplay of Night of Lotus. Since Matsuno worked as a producer with the Knight of Lotus team on Final Fantasy Tactics Advance, it seems likely he would have at least sampled the game. Music. I think the Knight of Lotus is one of Hitashi Sakamoto and Masaharu Iwata's best scores. It is, however, marred by the Game Boy Advance's pitiful sound capabilities, resulting in oftentimes shrill and downright annoying songs. There's a special place in my heart for it, and it doesn't sound quite like anything else in the Bass Escape Boys repertoire though I can understand anyone else hating it. The standout tracks are some of my all-time favorites, like the Fortune Teller theme opener, which feels both mysterious, haunting, and sad, and at the same time makes me want to explore the world of this game. It's just unique, for better or worse. Graphic. It looks like a Super Nintendo game. What's not to like? In the interview referenced above with Nintendo of Japan, they talked about how they considered making the colors more pastel, but that it wouldn't have looked like an ogre battle game. I think they found a nice balance, and you can see they progress more into those pastels in Final Fantasy Tactics Advance. The UI, character portraits, and animation are all stellar. One of the standout moments is near the end when Michael, a minion of Cher, transforms into a robe and slithers up a series of steps. Little flourishes like the way different characters perform their spells and how different weapons animate show an attention to detail that makes this game feel so polished. There were only a few glitches I encountered. A straight pixel line during two of the more flashier animations and a clipping issue with a dragon sprite underwater, but these were few and far. I love the way this game looks and hope to see it recreated in the Reborn engine any day now. Pro tips. Don't use the Neb's or anyone's fascination ability without suspending your game first. It softlocked my game multiple times on more than one occasion and googling it confirmed that I'm not the only one. Don't be afraid to suspend when persuading as well. There are certain spells that only appear on enemy units one time in the entire game. You can kill them and hope that the item they drop is that spell, but it's safer to just recruit them. With the focus on counterattacks in this game, the AI might kill themselves whilst you try to recruit them, suicidal boneheads that they are, but with the suspend features, you can suspend your fears and save your time. Quest mode is great, and the levels of the enemies don't scale unlike the main game. It's an easy way to grind for money, which the game is incredibly stingy with. Also, great and unique gear and some of the most powerful abilities in the game. When it's your turn, or before the battle even, you can look at the enemy units to see what special items, spells, and emblems they have. This recon allows you to plan out what units to kill slash recruit, and what prereqs you might need to unlock new classes. I've heard training mode is a thing, if you want to set the AI to automatic and set it and forget it, but that's not really my style. And I will judge you if you do that shit, like having your Oblivion character running into a wall. If you want to avoid an encounter, go back to the organized screen or shop. It resets the odds of encountering an encounter. Conclusion Playing Tactics Ogre at the Night of Lotus growing up was a formative experience for me. If Final Fantasy Tactics laid certain assumptions of what I should expect from a tactical RPG, the Night of Lotus did nothing to make me doubt those assumptions. Following that up with Final Fantasy Tactics Advance as the first three TRPGs I ever played, and it's no wonder why I see the genre in such a specific way. It's like imprinting on the first three movies you were ever shown, and they happen to be masterpieces like Blue Velvet, Twin Peaks Fire Walk With Me, and Mulholland Drive. So in the past or future, if you ever disagree with me about my take on a tactical RPG, then feel free to absolve yourself of caring about my critical opinion, because this style of TRPG is my style, aka the template for what I consider a good tactical RPG to be. I spent hundreds of hours 
playing The Knight of Lotus as a tween on my Game Boy player. This was also the same time I got my parents' old desktop computer in my room. So I was sitting pretty, playing Knight of Lotus while listening to my Creed's Human Clay, while the Windows Media Player Visualizer blasted the rabbit hole on my VGA screen. Come on, let's do it. this very day. Whenever I hear Creed, I am teleported back to those long summer hours sealed away from the Florida heat in my room playing the Night of Lotus. So it must have been fate that deigned Creed to play mere miles away from me at the same time I finished playing the Night of Lotus for this video. Though my bias and love for this game might generate some healthy skepticism of my objectivity, I have to say, Tactics Ogre, the Night of Lotus is a masterwork on the GBA and one of the finest tactical RPGs ever made. Only ranking lower than the absolute classics like Final Fantasy Tactics and Tactics Ogre proper in my books. It simplifies the Tactics Ogre experience while never being simple. There's a reason this quest team was trusted with the monumental task of Final Fantasy Tactics Advance. Not only a sequel to the most highly respected <coughs> bias, tactical RPG of all time, but also the game that would be the first to bridge the rift between Square and Nintendo since their Sony split. This is the last of the Ogre games I had on my list. If they ever translate Prince of Zenobia, I will give that one a go, but that seems to be the slightest of all the Ogre offerings in the story department. I am sad to see this story end, but hopeful that Tactics Ogre Reborn did well enough that there could be some future in the franchise. I will keep one eye open on it. Always. On the next episode of the Tactical RPG Odyssey, Final Fantasy Tactics Advanced Duh.